As the sun rose over the trees, a lone figure strode through the marketplace's maze of empty stalls. In the clothes of a merchant from far away, Hakim looked very out of place, especially at this hour. He sauntered expectantly, as if his presence alone would summon the activity he sought. Hakim turned towards the noise. He wasn't alone after all. As he peered behind a beaded curtain, he saw an old man hunched over a garment. <laughs> Hakim looked down over the tailor. Tis still dark outside. How can you see what you are sewing, old man? The tailor glared at Hakim, insulted. Yes, I may be old, but my eyesight is so keen that only last month I sewed together a corpse in darkness. What did you say? Hakim stepped forward, his curiosity aroused. Surely you meant you sewed a shroud for the deceased, not the man himself. The tailor continued his work. Ask me no more questions. Hakim held up an Ashrafi coin that glinted in the early morning sun. Tell me about this dead man, and in return, I will repay you with many more of these. He tossed the coin at the tailor and flashed a dagger hidden in his vest. For this man was not a merchant from a foreign land. This was a bandit one of the thieves who had pledged his life to find Ali Baba and kill him. I'm Vanessa Richardson. You're listening to Tales. Today, I'm continuing the story of Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves, the beloved story of magical treasure caves and murderous thieves. The tales on this podcast are dark, sometimes scary, and full of adult themes. As a warning, this story involves dark subjects, including multiple counts of beheading. Please exercise caution for children under 13. If you want to hear more tales, you can find episodes on your favorite podcast directory. A new episode will release every other Saturday, so if you enjoy it, subscribe. As mentioned in our previous episode, Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves is one of the most famous stories in One Thousand and One Nights, the famous collection of Middle Eastern folk tales, and this version continues with Antoine Galland's written translation from the 18th century. Variations on the story of Ali Baba have appeared all over the world, from India to Africa, as well as in European countries. In Greece, there is a version called The Two Brothers and the Forty-Nine Dragons. In Germany, there's Dumburg Castle. And a Slavic tale called Two Brothers also echoes this tale. In many versions, fully-sized adult men stuff themselves into large jars, unconventionally made out of leather. The idea of grown men hiding in jars seems outlandish, but the fact that this element pops up worldwide could add some veracity to the idea that this story is indeed plausible after all. Maybe there have been jars with mouths wide enough that we could fit ourselves in them. Or perhaps it has something to do with the odd detail that the jars are made from leather. This unusual but flexible material could help someone fit inside. Although, perhaps collectively, we just like the idea of being able to hide anywhere we want. Hakim watched as the tailor, Baba Mustafa, greedily picked up the coin. This was a man that could clearly be bought. He grinned. Tell me how to get to the home where you sewed together this man, Hakim ordered. That would be impossible. The tailor was being infuriatingly coy, even though Hakim knew the coin had piqued his interest. A mysterious woman came and led me there blindfolded. Hakim revealed another coin. 
Could you take me there if I blindfolded you and you retraced your steps? The tailor nodded. For several more coins, I can remember anything, he smiled. Hakim grabbed a stray cloth from Baba Mustafa's workbench. I only need this. Let's go. Slowly, they made their way through the city streets until they arrived precisely in front of Kasim's home. Hakim sent the tailor back on his way as he surveyed the street. It was a well-to-do neighborhood with beautiful homes and white walls surrounding all of the properties. He stood in front of the large door and contemplated how he could distinguish this door amongst all the rest. He did not want to get lost himself when he returned. He decided he would mark the house with an X. He took a piece of white chalk from his pocket so he could readily identify the home upon his return. Satisfied with his idea, he made his way back to the forest. Masood, the captain of the thieves, was growing restless, irritable. It had been over 40 days, and no one had any further information regarding the man who had trespassed into the lair. Masood and his men stood at attention at the noise. Someone was returning. Hakim rushed into the cave, breathless and excited. Captain! Exhausted, he bent over to catch his breath. Masood shifted with impatience. Speak, Hakim! The bandit took off his merchant's cap, revealing his ponytail and gold earrings. I have found the home of the man you are looking for, and marked the door with a white X. The thieves gathered around him, incredulous. Hakim explained that by a stroke of good fortune, he had chanced upon the tailor who had stitched together the man they butchered. Allah was finally bringing them justice. Masood smiled and rubbed his palms together. He pointed to several men waiting in the wings. Go, accompany Hakim back to the house of this villain and show him what we do with men who cross us. In the very house where Hakim had just marked an X, Morgiana got ready for her day. It had been a long 40 days of mourning for Kasim, as was the customary period. And during this time, Ali Baba and Karima had moved all of their belongings into Kasim's home. As the sole surviving brother, it was customary that what was Kasim's was now Ali Baba's. Ali Baba had also married Kasim's widow, Zara who had accepted her role of Ali Baba's second wife with grace and appreciation. It had been a time of sadness and upheaval, and Morgiana was glad that things seemed to be settling back to normal. Although, during this time of grieving, Kasim's handsome son, Abazar, had been by to visit almost every day. Morgiana had enjoyed getting to speak with the kind, intelligent man, she knew that they would never be together, but it was still nice to see him all the same. She would miss his frequent visits. Morgiana emerged from the home to run the day's errands. As she closed the door to the compound behind her, she noticed something strange on the wall next to the gated entry. White chalk marks in the shape of an X. She frowned. She had never noticed this before. She had the gut feeling it was not a good sign. It was as if someone had marked the home as a target. Ever since Kasim's death, she had been regarding people a little more suspiciously, as if they might find out the secret that only she, Ali Baba, and Zara shared. She looked around to see if anyone was watching her, if anyone looked suspicious, or perhaps there was the face of someone she didn't recognize. But there was nothing out of the ordinary. She set down her basket and retrieved a piece of white chalk from inside the home. 
she quickly drew a white X on the doors of all the neighboring homes. If someone was trying to mark them as a target, she was going to do whatever she could to confuse their aim. She looked up and down the street, pleased with her handiwork. Morgiana slid the chalk into the bottom of her basket, smiled slyly, and innocently made her way to the market to complete her day's errands. Hakim, no longer in his fake merchant's garb, turned the corner onto the street where Ali Baba's home stood with four of his fellow thieves in tow. Here it is, Hakim announced, pointing at a white X. I marked this door, as you can see here. He was proud of his foolproof idea. A skinny man with a pronounced Adam's apple pointed to the opposite side of the street. What about that X, then? Hakim spun around, and, lo and behold, there was another white X. Another bandit with pockmarks all over his face scoffed. Did you put X's on all the houses? The five men looked up and down the street. There were X's on all the houses. No, of course not. This isn't possible, Hakim cried. I came here with the man this morning. I just put an X on one house. A group of school-age children rounded the corner and took note of the five uncouth men milling about their neighborhood wildly out of place. They stopped laughing and stared. The confused bandits quieted down. Hakim spat and stalked off. The men returned to the cave, agitated and discouraged. Masood called Hakim to stand in front of the group. Nervously, he stepped forward. And? Masood asked. Hakim shook his head. Someone marked all of the other doors with white X's, and I could not remember which was my own. Let me go back to the tailor. I promise I will not fail you this time. Someone is trying to trick us, but I will outsmart them. The man fell to his knees. Masood considered the man's words for a moment. Please, he begged. I will show you no mercy. Masood ran his sword through Hakim's neck, beheading him instantly. Hakim's head rolled to the feet of the other thieves. Masood turned to his men. I will not give second chances. Our cave has been breached, and now we have been outwitted. We will not show weakness. A man, Bezad, stepped forward. A short man with beady eyes, a cunning about him. Let me go. I will find the house. I will not disappoint. Masood gave a curt nod for the man to go. Our story will continue in a moment after a brief message. Listeners, this month marks 60 years since John F. Kennedy became the 35th President of the United States, ushering his already prominent family into the highest enclaves of political power. But behind their storied successes lie secrets and scandals so severe, if it were any other lineage, they would have been left in ruin. This January, to commemorate this iconic milestone, dig into the dramas of a real-life American dynasty in the Spotify original from ParCast, The Kennedys. This exclusive series from Spotify features your favorite podcast hosts, including me, covering every angle of the Kennedys from shows like Conspiracy Theories, Unsolved Murders, Crime Countdown, and others. Assassinations and conspiracies, corruption and cover-ups, international affairs, and extramarital ones, too. Examine all of the Kennedy family's most controversial moments, all in one place. You can binge all 12 episodes of the this limited series starting on Tuesday, January 19th. Follow the Kennedys free and exclusively on Spotify. And now back to our story. Bazad, the second thief, followed in the footsteps of Hakim. He returned to Baba Mustafa, 
who once again obliged the man by guiding him to the home blindfolded, this time for double the money. Bezad asked who lived in this house, but Baba Mustafa responded that he was a lowly tailor. He was not familiar with the men of this rich neighborhood. He could provide no answer for him. When they arrived on Ali Baba's street, Bazad surveyed that the white chalk marks remained on all the homes on this street. He sent the tailor on his way and milled about trying to figure out a way that he would not be fooled by what Hakim had been fooled by. Aha! He had an ingenious solution. He decided to mark the house with a red X. This would certainly stand out so they would recognize the place upon their return. He hastened back to the cave to gather the bandits so they could return and vanquish their foe. With three of his colleagues in tow, Bezad returned later that day. The sun was setting. It was a perfect time to stake out the home and act in the cover of darkness. Bezad walked proudly up to a red X. Here it is. The bandit with the Adam's apple, who had come on the mission the last time, pointed across the street. Are you sure it's not that one? The man with the pockmarked face shook his head and jerked his thumb towards another red X. You're just as dumb as Hakim. Bazad looked around in horror as he noted that next to every white X was now a cursed red X. He had been foiled as well. Masood sat sipping his scalding hot tea in an ornately carved teak chair and looked up to the group of men returning. He raised his eyebrows when he saw their dumb, trembling faces. They had clearly failed. So? he asked archly. Bezad stepped forward. I could no longer tell which house was the offending man's. And why is that? Well, um... He glanced nervously around the 39 men. There were red X's on all of the homes this time. Masood considered this. So, instead of white X's on all the houses, there were red X's on all of the houses? The man nodded. Exactly. Masood exploded. You're telling me that you fell for the same trick Hakim did? The man nodded. Masood turned away from him for a moment. Fools! Two men have failed me. I do not believe that any of you are capable of remembering what his house looks like. How do you even remember your way back here? Masood stepped menacingly towards Bazad, who fell to his knees, hands together, begging for mercy. Please, spare me. <laughs> Bazad's head fell to the ground. His body slumped over a few seconds later, hands still clasped in prayer. I will take care of this myself, Masood shouted. He kicked this man's severed head onto the cave wall, blood spattering across the face of a man inches away. Masood had not wanted to kill two of his most loyal men, but if there was one thing he couldn't stand, it was incompetence. What was loyalty if the man couldn't remember what a house looked like? Masood cursed and dug his spurs into his horse angrily. What had they been thinking? The person who had breached their cave was clearly a powerful, scheming individual. To defeat this type of person, you would have to use guile, wit, stealth. His men demonstrated none of these skills. Clearly, only he was up to the task. Like his men before him, Masood returned to Baba Mustafa. It made him sick to his stomach to think of all the Ashrafi coins that they had dumped into this man's lap by this point. When he told the tailor that he wanted to blindfold him and take him to the same house for the third time, 
He could see the man almost stifle a giggle. Masood wanted to punch the smug man in the face. I might never have to sew another shroud again, the tailor mused as he accepted more coins. I can do without the jokes, Masood glowered. Suit yourself. Baba Mustafa dutifully remained silent as he retraced his steps with the captain. When Baba Mustafa dropped Masood off at the gates of the beautiful home, the tailor turned to him. Whom shall I expect next? He asked wryly. Masood almost snarled at the man. There shall be no more Ashrafi for you, greedy man. I am the last. Baba Mustafa shrugged nonchalantly. Pity. You've all turned out to be such wonderful customers. Well, I hope you finally find what or whom you are looking for. Masood turned away and ignored the man. He studied the home before him. Yes, the homes were all of the same architecture and color, but still, it seemed inconceivable that they could not have noted that this house was easily the most stunning on this street, or observe that, unlike the sparse yard surrounding it, this house had especially large jasmine trees lining the perimeter, imbeciles. In a huff, Masood returned at once to the cave and gathered his men around him. I have found the house and impressed it upon my heart. No need for chalk marks or silly tricks. We commence our retaliation tonight, all of us. Silence! When someone dares to rob us in our home, we will go to their home and repay the favor ten times over. Masood smiled cruelly. Mohammed, you shall procure nineteen mules, and Bamdad, you shall procure thirty-eight large leather jars for mustard oil, which will be placed on the backs of these mules, two by two. Why do we need these, I hear you say? Well, I have devised an ingenious plan. A plan that will bring us victory over this cunning foe. You see, we shall come to his house in the guise that I am a seller of mustard oil. And yet there will only be mustard oil in one of these jars. Masood smiled slyly and paused for dramatic effect. In the other thirty-seven leather jars will be each of you. I shall beg for shelter for a night, as I am but a weary traveler on the road with many a mule that need refuge for the night. In this way we shall infiltrate his compound, and when everyone has gone to bed, I shall give you the signal to emerge from your hiding, and we shall strike! We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now let's continue the story. The next evening, dressed in humble trader's clothes, Masood whistled amiably as he guided his 19 mules down Ali Baba's street. He couldn't believe his good fortune. Allah was definitely on his side, for the master of the house himself was strolling in front of his home, enjoying a post-dinner walk. Masood brought his mule up to the pleasant-looking man, and the man greeted him genially. Masood thought that his nemesis must be an exceedingly devious man, because his expression did not betray at all what sort of scheming he could do. He was warm and friendly, in fact, the man appeared quite simple to Masood. Ali Baba introduced himself, and Masood told Ali Baba the story he had concocted, how he had traveled all day to get here, and because of an injury with one of his beasts, he had not made it to the marketplace in time. This had obviously cost Masood valuable time and money, 
if Ali Baba would be so kind as to just let him tarry for the night in the courtyard, so he could relieve the mules of their loads, he would be ever so grateful. He assured him that he would be out first thing in the morning to make haste to the market place. Of course, of course, Ali Baba eagerly responded. He was most hospitable to Masood's request. Masood was not accustomed to wealthy men being so warm and welcoming. He had thought he was going to have to work a little harder to sell his lie, but it was all coming together so easily. Perhaps this was going to be much simpler than he thought. The master of the house called for his slave girl, Morgiana. She came right away, and Masood found her quite pleasing on the eye. She did not make eye contact with him, but kept her eyes trained on her master. Morgiana, please prepare a supper for this weary traveler, he ordered her. Yes, sir, she responded quickly and without insolence. Masood couldn't help but envy Ali Baba for this beautiful slave girl, so serene and quiet, so submissive, as if she couldn't hurt a fly. The world needed more women like this Morgiana. Ali Baba insisted that Morgiana prepare a bed for Masood to sleep inside the house, rather than out in the shed, which was plenty spacious for all of the mules to rest in that night. Then Ali had his slave boy, Abdullah, bring grain and water for Masood's mules. The hospitality was so overwhelming that Masood almost thought that this man surely couldn't be the man he was looking for. The same man who snuck into their cave and retrieved a body hacked into pieces. But he knew that sometimes the shiniest veneers hid the murkiest of souls. After Masood had eaten and bathed and was ready to retire for the night, he crept out to the shed and spoke firmly to his men. At midnight, when you hear my voice, slice open your leather jars and make haste to the courtyard. We will overtake the home at once. He left the shed, and the comely Morgiana led him dutifully to the bed she had prepared for him off the kitchen. She held the lamp up to her face. If you need anything else, do not hesitate to ask. Your wish is my command. She lowered her head in deference. He said he wouldn't be requiring anything else and watched her disappear back into the kitchen. He sighed and readied his thoughts towards the task at hand. He had to stay focused on executing this plan. Oh. Masood's eyelids grew heavy. He did not want to fall asleep, but he hadn't been treated this well his entire life. He felt so relaxed. Perhaps I will become the master of this home myself and take that slave girl as my wife. He smiled to himself at the thought of having Morjana wait on him hand and foot, and he drifted off to sleep. That night, as Morjana was finishing up her evening's duties, she lost track of the time. She had been working far later than she normally did, due to the extra work involved with their guest. She washed all of the dishes, and then laid out Ali's crisp, freshly laundered white clothes for the next morning. As she walked back to the kitchen to check on the broth she was boiling for the next morning, her lamp went out. Well, this was inconvenient. She had not planned on being up this late, and she still needed to complete her tasks. She would simply have to do them in the dark, she supposed. Morgiana carefully made her way down the hall in the pitch blackness to the slave quarters where Abdullah had already gone to sleep. Abdullah! Abdullah! Morgiana whispered loudly. The lamps have gone out, and I can see nothing. Will you go and retrieve some oil in the morning? Abdullah rolled over, uninterested in waking up. The merchant sells oil. Just go take some from the shed. There are more than thirty jars. 
Oh, thank you. Morgiana thought for a moment. Well, that was an idea. Surely, if she took just a little to finish her nightly duties, the man would understand. She would make sure to just tell him in the morning. Morjana pulled her shawl around her as she made her way quickly across the yard to the shed, her path lit by the bright moon above. She stepped inside and saw that indeed the room was filled with massive jars of oil. She had never seen this much oil in her entire life. She chuckled at the happy accident. Surely the merchant would never notice if she siphoned off just enough for her to finish making the broth in the kitchen. She walked over to a jar and was about to dip her wick into the oil when, Is it time to sally forth yet, Captain? Morgiana stifled a gasp. The jar spoke. She looked around to see if there was someone lurking in the shadows, but no one stepped forward. Captain? The voice spoke again. Morgiana could tell that it had come from the jar indeed. Trembling, Morgiana peered forward, keeping her shawl wrapped tightly around her face, so if anyone could make her out, they would not know that she was a woman, but perhaps confuse her for the captain. She could make out the dark hair of the top of a man's head. Shocked, she jumped back in horror. A man was in the jar! She closed her eyes, trying to keep her wits about her. Captain? A deeper voice came from another jar further down the row. Morgiana glanced further into the darker corners of the shed and covered her mouth in fright. There were more. Captain! And yet again, another man's voice whispered from another corner of the shed. Morgiana stepped back slowly in a dawning horror. These men were in hiding, waiting to enact a plot against her master. Captain! 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 The voices were numerous now, coming from every direction. Morgiana looked around. It seemed that the jars were endless. If anyone poked their head up and saw her, she was never getting out of there alive. What was she to do? Next week, we'll continue the tale of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves as Morgiana defends her home against Masood's 37 thieves. How will she escape this? And what will become of Ali Baba now that his brother's killer has tracked him down? Tune in to our final episode of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves to find out. Thanks for listening to Tales. If you want to listen to more tales, you can find us and subscribe on your favorite podcast directory or listen on parcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, we truly appreciate a five-star review. Tales was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Tales is written by Gina Machusek. I'm Vanessa Richardson.